talk is Dan Svodarsky. Uh, Dan is going to be talking about uh, introducing the Aspen Parkland system and talking a little bit about it. Let's see if I can get your slides up here, Dan. Did you say you're likely to stick around here or to, do you want to be able to walk around? How should I advance <clears throat> if uh, I walk around? If you walk around, you would use this. This guy? Yep. Okay. Uh, if you walk around, I need to give you the lapel mic. You can okay. do like that. Probably, uh, okay. I'm a roller. All right. Why don't you clip it right about there, okay. nice and high. You can flip it over if I've got it facing the wrong way. And Dan, that monitor is going to show you how much time you have for me. Okay. Seven seconds left. Ooh, yeah, not much going. time. Well, John Amendinger in the first uh, presentation that we heard talked about the uh, northwest corner of Minnesota, the Aspen Parkland. So that's where I'm going to be starting. I, I lived there and have lived there since 1969. <coughs> Let's see, I suppose about half of you anyway were haploid at that point in time when I started there, but uh, still there. And we have a, a, a diverse ecosystem there. Mixture of oak and aspen, <clears throat> trembling aspen, and a prairie mix, which is really a cool uh, kind of an ecosystem. Lots of variety, as we've uh, as we heard. But kind of an overview of the uh, topics, a bit of a historical overview, going way back some thousands of years, and talking a bit about some of the herbivores, particularly uh, bison some of the changes in the landscape over the years and the last 50 that I can personally vouch for. And then some of the implications of these changes for uh, contemporary management that uh, you know, hopefully we can learn from history. And then a little bit of a, of a summary. And if I don't uh, remember later, the legacy amendment that was uh, passed in 2008 before we had the big recession and uh, that has provided funds that are really come in handy <coughs> when it comes to uh, buying the kind of toys that the managers have now that, uh, <coughs> that John Urkels will talk about. And then just touch a little bit about biomass. There's a lot of biomass out there that, uh, that could have some potential for a uh, fuel resource. This is a uh, depiction by Ernest Thomas Seton on what the uh, Manitoba forest would have uh, looked like in 1905. <clears throat> and this striped area here essentially represents Aspen Parkland. Hugely expansive ecosystem type in uh, north of the border. We just have a little peninsula that comes down in, into northwestern Minnesota. But there's Winnipeg and a little town of Russell and Carberry, which is where the uh, Aspen Parkland Edge was in 1905, and then in this uh, uh, grayish or a uh, uh, yellowish line there, that's where it had advanced in uh, roughly uh, 50 years later in a follow-up map that I, I will show. So it's been a very dynamic uh, ecosystem type as it has responded to drought and herbivores and, and, uh, and fire. <clears throat> This is a, a map from uh, Ralph Bird's publication, The Ecology of the Aspen Parkland, that shows the, uh, the expansion of the Aspen Parkland uh, southward, particularly out in, uh, in this area. So again, a uh, dynamic ecosystem. And there's the little peninsulas of Aspen Parkland that we have coming down into Minnesota. And then in the Dakotas, the uh, Turtle Mountains area and, uh, and such. This is the uh, depiction of the oak savanna. I grew up about right here at the edge of the oaks in southern Missouri where uh, Joe Martin Marshall talked about the other day and I'm now up here, 25 miles from Grand Forks, North Dakota. So we are at the uh, kind of the northern edge of this map of the oak savanna, but uh, of course it's pretty ex extensive in spots, but especially up in, the, in Manitoba. And of course, that has been a, a fire and uh, grazing maintained ecosystem over the, over the years. 
Uh, I-94, which crosses into Minnesota around the Fargo-Moorhead area, comes down to the Twin City. In many cases, that kind of follows the border of the uh, historic Oak Savannah. This is about around Fergus Falls. And pretty open grown here. Not much aspen gets uh, that far down, at least that far out on the, on the prairie. <clears throat> Again, a very interesting uh, complex of ecosystems types there in Northwest Minnesota with the inner fingering of Oak Savannah, some of which has been essentially converted into uh, Aspen Parkland. A little bit more about that. But you don't have to go too far to find the boreal forest and, and uh, spruce, spruce fir, and so on. Again, another, uh, another map of the Aspen Parkland. This is another view, uh, kind of a topographical view, view of uh, Northwest Minnesota, Grand Forks uh, being, being there, the Red River flows north, of course. Uh, it maybe looks like it's kind of a bowl here, but it's really flat. It's flat as this floor most of the time. Uh, here's another view of the Red River of the north. Here is a Park River shown in the circle there, and that will be of relevance here as we talk about, uh, reflect on some of the uh, fur trading posts and that. And Pemina up on the uh, up on the border, which is where the uh, historic fort, which was first started by Alexander Henry, at where the Park River joins the Red River, and uh, he, that was moved to uh, up to Pemina <coughs> to uh, look at the uh, at at the fur trading and, and where that was located. Here's kind of an interesting historical aspect. Uh, these were quotes of Alexander Henry in 1801, talking about the, uh, the drowned buffalo. And I'm not sure what the, all the circumstances of how they, all these buffalo drown, but for, uh, for two days, well off and on for the full month of April, the river clear of ice, but drowned buffalo continued to drift by in, in entire herds. For two days and nights, drowned buffalo still drifting down the river around May 1. The stench, <laughs> and those of you that ever had to dra drag off a, a, a dead cow, you can just multiply that by several, uh, and whew, not good. Stench, vast numbers was intolerable. And this is what it might have, uh, might have looked like. This was a depiction from 60 miles southwest of uh, Grand Forks, North Dakota. Estimation of a couple hundred thousand of, uh, of bison. This was Fort Pemina <coughs> around the uh, uh, 1800s, early 1800s, and the Red River ox carts bringing in uh, uh, probably some buffalo skins and beaver and, and uh, so on. So that's what that country might have looked like at, at that point in time. And this is again a, a depiction by Alexander Henry in 1801, talked about uh, around the Pemina River and uh, climbing up a tree, and as far as the eye could see, the plains were covered by buffalo in all directions. I think this is perhaps a view from Dances with Wolves, but uh, you just magnify that to a whole landscape, kind of neat. Well, the bison, of course, were tough on trees. They liked to uh, wallow in the, uh, the dirt and scrub on the trees. And also, they liked to rub on rocks. There's kind of a cool picture in the uh, upper right there that Jim Brandenburg took of uh, bison rubbing on, uh, on big rocks. We call those buffalo rocks. <laughs> this is a picture from Ralph Bird's book, The Ecology of the Aspen Parkland, but shows uh, what cattle do. To, uh, to Aspen, Buffalo would have done uh, approximately the same thing. And also in this picture, you see a depression around this rock because rocks were sought out by, uh, by bison for rubbing. And uh, <clears throat> he talks about Henry in 1801 about the, uh, the trees being, uh, being rubbed. And then the, except the larger trees, the bark of which is rubbed perfectly smooth, he's talking about cottonwoods, perfectly smooth and heaps of wool and hair lie at the foot of those trees. So this is uh, what a lot of the Aspen Parkland looks like these days, where you have expansion of willows and 
and, uh, and aspen into a, a prairie matrix. And it can change fast without uh, some sort of disturbance management. <coughs> now this is a kind of a complicated uh, diagram from John McAndrews, who did a, uh, often called the Itasca transect. Starting in the Red River Valley, this is the topographic view. Starting in the Red River Valley in the Lacustrian Plains, you go up a little bit in elevation. And uh, over here is Lake Itasca. So that gives you kind of a, a distance perspective there. But this was a paleoecological study. You can see these vertical lines. There's three or four of them there <coughs> where you did pollen cores to reconstruct what the climate was back to about 11,000 years before present. Really a fascinating study to, to read. Okay, so for example, at, at Lake Itasca, pollen core there helps us understand what the vegetation was roughly 8,500 or so years ago. And uh, it was oak savanna, uh, prairie, grass, grass pollen, artemisia, and so on. And uh, so it's been a very dynamic transition and border there over time as a result of climate change, glaciation, and, and that, and the uh, advance of, of glaciers to a point, dammed up some of the uh, flowages, and then reflooded part of the basin about 8,500 years ago, and so on. So again, a, a very interesting uh, and dynamic transition here from the flatlands <coughs> to the uplands. And the little bit of rise that you get actually adds to the increased precipitation as you go from west to east. And that has had an effect upon the uh, uh, vegetation in response to the precipitation. So I mentioned the paleo, uh, paleo Indian bison hunters here. Uh, at Itasca State Park in uh, the area here, here's uh, the bison kill site. And this was where the McAndrews uh, transect was, uh, was made uh, in the 60s. Okay, if you uh, go to the Nicolette uh, Creek foliage into Lake Itasca, they were going to be uh, improving the road there. And lo and behold, they found a lot of bison bones as they would dig down in the peak. And at that time, again, roughly uh, 8,500 years ago, there was another uh, subspecies of bison, Austin and Talus that had a little wider uh, horn span, so to speak, 42 inches as opposed to the conventional 30 inches of bison, bison, the current uh, buffalo. So, so that was cool. And they would, uh, there was three or four feet of peak there. And apparently the, the bison were more vulnerable there in the fall. So that's when the uh, Native Americans would, would ambush them there <coughs> as they were moving towards the uh, more protected areas for the winter. Uh, this is Pancrats Prairie near where I live. And this is the Buffalo Rock, big one. And again, the bison used to rub themselves on these rocks as well as the trees. And this uh, different color vegetation area here would have been made largely by the bison rubbing himself, wallowing. And so I guess that would be called uh, bovidomorphic or something like that uh, because it would be a bovid origin. Huge depression and here you can see it in the different vegetation surrounding it and there's kind of a zonation of uh, different vegetation types, aquatic vegetation uh, surround that. And uh, it was the deepest right here at this overhanging ledge and I'm standing by it. So it, it was about uh, five and a half feet deep at that point. Earlier, it would have been even deeper because it's been 100 years or so since bison were in that area. So there have been sediments that have accumulated since. <clears throat> and of course, that has influence, set the stage for other species. And here's a crane nesting right here. <laughs> there she is, keeping a watchful eye on me. So lots of things going on. Here's an aerial view <clears throat> of the uh, Pancrats Prairie. That's the Nature Conservancy track. And here's that. Uh, Here's that bison wetland. And you can still see that buffalo rock from the, uh, from the air. Changes 
in this countryside, it's a, it's a lot more brushy now than it, uh, than it was 50 years ago when I first came to that uh, country. This is part of the uh, Pancrats Prairie North on the other side of the tracks. So this is earlier on. Uh, that was a DNR approved vehicle at the time. <laughs> I don't know where you would have to be able to find one of these now. <laughs> Junkyard maybe. Uh, my hair was a little darker then. Uh, actually, the DNR folks cut down the aspen trees. And you know what happens when you cut down the source of the oxen, which depresses the uh, suckering. It really stimulated the suckering. Uh, I think, yeah, there's, there's the buffalo rock that you can see right there. So things have, uh, have really changed. This is more <coughs> from the country up in uh, John Urkel's neighborhood, which you'll hear about next. With a, it's just a, for those of you that have not been to the Aspen Park, it's just really a cool ecosystem with, a, with lots of diversity and openings and, and that. <coughs> Some elk there, used to be more elk, of course, but uh, there's still a few remnant elk in the area, not many bison. And this is kind of a depiction of, of what the, uh, the countryside looks like with the Aspen uh, sucker shoots coming out into the, <coughs> the uh, Boostin Prairie and that. Sharp tails are in the area around Crooks and we have uh, perhaps reflective of the changing in the brush index. In many cases, we have as many sharp tails now as we do prairie chickens. Used to be the other way around. We had maybe 10% sharp tails, the rest chickens. So that, uh, that is changing. Those are sharp tails there. <coughs> this is the uh, Pemina Trail Preserve, those of you that are familiar with that, that's the Nature Conservancy area. And uh, this was a picture from 75, just reflect on some of the changes that have occurred. And these are the aspen groves uh, in the up, upper part of the picture. And much of those were bulldozed down as it was converted to a big farming operation, which set the stage for what is now the Glacial Ridge National Wildlife Refuge which looks more like this <clears throat> now. You see all the aspen have been, or much of them have been cleared out. And this is the good work of the Nature Conservancy people as they have been uh, using fire to manage the, uh, the aspen groves there. Again, in what is now the Pemina Trail Preserve. Much of the surrounding areas have been intensively uh, cleared out, farm, drain, and so on. So that is what has happened in some of the periphery area, except that which was acquired when the Glacier Ridge National Wildlife Refuge was created. Some of the other influences occurring in the area, we used to think a lot of this country was too wet or dry to farm. Well, wrong on that. So that, those kind of changes have affected the uh, adjacent hydrology to some of the DNR tracks, Fish and Wildlife Service tracks. Okay, back to, uh, <coughs> back to fires. This is an account by Henry Hine from 1859, talking about the uh, Native American set fires. He talked about uh, fires going a, a thousand miles in length and several hundred in breadth all along this. You can see the extensiveness <coughs> the Aspen Parkland in, uh, in Canada. A vast conflagration. <laughs> what a nice expression. Maybe, maybe something like that that you see in the upper right-hand corner. Uh, this is some of the work that we've done near the uh, Crookston campus of the university where I've, I've been over the years. We have a little natural history area with a bit of Aspen Parkland in it. And we've done some demonstration burning there, just sort of anecdotally and with some data collection when we had the uh, time and opportunity over <coughs> burn there in some cases later in the year when, and just realize that you can get a better top kill. Uh, and it actually affects the roots, root reserves if you burn when the, uh, uh, the full leaves are out. And also we're looking at uh, controlling smooth growth. So good way to put up a lot of smoke too, as most of you know. And uh, again, this is 75 when we, or 71 when we started out putting in some uh, little burn plots where the uh, 
ecotone comes out into the grass. <clears throat> and then we noted later on that there was a little pink showing up. Well, that was remnant prairie vegetation here. This had been heavily grazed. That was a uh, remnant prairie vegetation. So we've stimulated that over the years by doing the uh, prescribed burning in the, in the spring, biennial plots as well as annual plots. And here we're extracting <coughs> the uh, sucker root system from a little clump of aspen. This is the uh, Manitoba Museum of Man and Nature where they've extracted uh, a little clump of, uh, of aspen with showing the sucker shoots. Some of these sucker shoots can, uh, and an early professor at the Itasca Biological Station, Murray Buell, traced one, I think it was 31 meters long or something. Yeah, 31 meters long. Uh, so they can uh, really go a long way. And some of the uh, aspen clones that are attached to the same root system, I've seen estimates of essentially half a football field in size. So very, very extensive. <clears throat> so some of the students, I don't know if any current students in here are in that picture or not. But <laughs> okay, uh, long and the short of it here. Had little plots with annual burn and biennial burns for 13 years. And uh, roughly after about 10 years, the, uh, the Kentucky bluegrass diminished, the big blue stem and little blue stem increased. And it was about the same when you compared annual burn to biennial burn. And so it's a good thing. But we recommended them from that. It takes about 10 years to get the rejuvenation, at least in this situation. And, uh, and then uh, no point in doing it every year when you get about the same results but with every other year. So again, kind of anecdotal, but a nice little demonstration. So some of the uh, lessons learned. <clears throat> this was a nice piece of Aspen Parkland just east of the campus. And this was annually uh, hay and basically native prairie, but there isn't much mar a market for native prairie. So that, that stopped because of the diminishing market. And you can imagine then what happened with the surrounding vegetation. Uh, the aspen sucker shoots, which were formerly uh, top killed by the haying, they started popping up. Another interesting thing about this was you go into these little clones here of aspen, and there were these open grown bur oak trees. So it was started out as an oak savanna, and then the uh, aspen grew in around it. <clears throat> and this is, uh, this just kind of illustrates a differential response of trees to fire. This is across the border in Manitoba, around Tolstoy and Gardenton, for those of you that know where that uh, area is. And the first time I saw that, I was curious <clears throat> because there are all these top killed Aspen sucker shoots right up to the clone, and then, then they stopped. Well, come to find out, they used to burn early in the spring, well, that when there was still maybe a foot or so of snow in these clones. And uh, the local farmers and, and grazers, because they, they grazed a lot of this, uh, they, they were a little short on, on fire breaks. They just said it and let it go. <laughs> and it would go out on its own once it hit the tree. But that has, uh, that's kind of gone by the wayside now. And a lot of these areas are really brushy. because They're just not getting burned like they once were. <clears throat> well, this is another way to control the aspen invasion of, of grassland. This is season-long burning, year after year after year. This is just north of the uh, Tempanucas Wildlife Management Areas, which is one of our uh, marquee wildlife management <coughs> areas in uh, northwest Minnesota. And this is some demonstration burning or a grazing that we did after burning in a nature conservancy area. And, uh, and that works because cows will eat aspen. Another thing that was interesting here, and, uh, and that was uh, this cow herd would go after some of these aspen, some of which were 15, 20 feet high. And they would start walking them down underneath their butt legs eating the leaves as they would go and keep eating the leaves all the way to the top of the, of the trees. Wish I knew more about the dynamics of that. Some of the, uh, some of the burning that's going on on the Pancrats Prairie and the Kirchenville Wildlife Management Area of the uh, Minnesota DNR 
If you burn it frequently, like that once every two or three years, you just stimulate the aspirin. Maybe even increase it. So that's not the answer by itself, but maybe some combination of grazing, mowing, brush chopping. So there's still, still work to be done there. Again, those, those of you that know the Aspen Parkland, know something about Aspen, they really come charging back. And this is an interesting thing that I've started seeing in recent years, and that's red osier dogwood. It seems to really be thriving. Of course, here is the uh, fence line when we had cattle there. And so the seeds, the fruits, were distributed there by, by birds. But uh, it's, it's really going. The deer can't keep up with it. We have plenty of deer, too. OK, this is, uh, you know, sometimes you learn more from things that don't quite work out than those that do. Well, this is burning a calcareous fin, one of Minnesota's nicest calcareous fins. Pancrats Prairie <coughs> had a dry fall. Hey, that'd be a good time to burn the fin. This is now Nature Conservancy. <coughs> and so, so we did. And I live out in that area. And I started, I would see a little <coughs> wisp of smoke coming out of the fin. And, uh, but the wind was coming away from the fin. And then the wind shifted towards my house. And I could smell the unmistakable smell of peat smoke. <laughs> Okay, here's what happened. If you let uh, a calcareous fin go too far and get some aspen clones in there, they will wick out the moisture in the peat. And it gets on fire, and then it starts drying itself out as it goes. So we hauled a little hose from the DNR office, strung that out, and that's the only way that I know of to, uh, to put out a peat fire. But again, you'll learn some things. Another little way to manage aspen parkland is to uh, chop it. But there's a lot of biomass there to, to do that. And it's pretty energy intensive. And you can go from this to, to this. And, and John's going to talk more about the scale that they operate on up in his uh, country to the north there. And then. Uh, <coughs> You chop that down, then you get some fuel, and then you can uh, you can burn it, and you can make some uh, some kind of instant aspen parkland. But again, there's a lot of biomass that was consumed there that you could use and help pay the bills with pelletizing. And they're doing much more of this kind of work in uh, to the north of us in Manitoba, where they're phasing out coal. They have a carbon tax, and that changes the economics of biomass. And in this country. Uh, biomass economics are not as favorable as they are in some other parts of the world. Here's another way you can manage aspen with these bio balers. This is uh, Joe Schaefer used to have one of these at Native Prairie Landscapes. Made in Quebec, I think it is. And I don't think this uh, biomass plant is still going. But ideally, if you have a, a system that can burn these brush bio bales, that would be pretty efficient. But if you have to break them apart and then feed them in, then that's a little different story. Economics, biomass, not very good these days, but the potential is there. Go to Europe sometime if you have it. Oh my gosh, it really changes, uh, changes your outlook. But some of the biomass facilities that have been and could come again in the state of Minnesota, this is the Morris campus where they have a biomass uh, burner. I think these are, uh, this is one of the round bales of cattails that I delivered down there because I've gotten into cattail work here in the last uh, few years. Now these are actually uh, either wood chips or corn cobs. They, they've done both. This is at the Morris campus. But there's no reason these are cattail bales. There's no reason that you can't use cattails because once you get cattails into pellets, they have the same a BTU value as wood chips. So again, good potential there. Well, just to summarize a little bit, <coughs> we've learned some things. We've got more to, uh, to learn. And I'll just read this quote here from Jason Eckstein, who's standing back, <laughs> sitting back here someplace. A lot of experience, and John will talk more about this coming up. The brush is taken over. We can't kill brush. 
Burning in the springs just top kills it. Summer and fall, set it back. The best result I have seen is back to back mowing of a fire break in September, which kept the brush off for five years. And you can visit with Jason for more specific. There's Jason right over there. Okay, there's Jason again. He's so spoiled. This is what in 75 we were doing for equipment. <laughs> Illegal three wheelers. I still have one though. And uh, you, you'll make new, and that's uh, Jordy Jack here. That's Dennis Jordy on the back. He was the assistant manager at uh, Northern Prairie Wildlife Research Center. Uh, he came up in the world after this, this life. But uh, $92,000, and that's just for the machine, right? Yeah. <laughs> Okay, uh, echinacea, and educating people about prairies, and uh, they will understand what they're taught. And one little more, whoop here, I don't know if I can get this going or not, maybe. Uh, speaking of echinacea, this is just a short little video. She's going here. But from an environmental education standpoint, if you want to make a little video. This is about synchronizes the flowering of echinacea with burning. And the important qualities. Prescribed fire to set the control between mentors. Developed by Greta Hell, who some of you perhaps know, and her husband, who is the son of the senator, was the So I'll just let them finish up. Thank you. Now we'll hear from Rebecca. So I think in the interest of time, what I'm going to do is share this link with everybody and pause for now. Let's thank Dan. All right, and next up. <laughs>